Focus 2, Class Audio, by Sue Kay, Vaughan Jones, Daniel Brayshaw, Bartosz Mikorowski, and Linda Edwards. Published by Pearson. Copyright Pearson Education Limited, 2016. MP3 Track 2 Oh, nice photos. Thanks. This is me and my mum. She's a journalist. She writes articles for a magazine. And this is my dad. He thinks he can play football. Your mum looks nice. What does your dad do? He works in a bank. Do you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I've got a brother and twin sisters. Here are my sisters. They're 11 and they argue all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the baby? That's my niece. My brother got married last year and this is his first child. Her name's Charlotte Elizabeth, but we call her Charlie. So you're Charlie's aunt? Yes, it's funny to be an aunt. That's my brother and my sister-in-law. They live in Paris. Oh, and I suppose these are your grandparents? Not exactly. That's my grandpa, but the woman isn't my grandma. It's his girlfriend. They have a house in Spain and they go there a lot. Oh, <laughs> interesting. MP3 Track 3 1 Three. Five. Many of us face on an everyday basis Can't do what they created to do Never made it, I'm young so I'ma take it And run fast with it like Kunta Kinte I'll do it my way when I'm breaking away, yo Don't hunt me down, homie, I'll find you But I'ma keep it moving, that's what I was born to do so. MP3 Track 4 How They Met Do you know how your favourite bands first got together? Many of the most famous bands were friends at school or college. International superstars U2 met in secondary school. When he was 14, Larry, the drummer, planned to start a band. So he put an ad on the school notice board. The other members of U2 answered it, and they are still together 40 years later. British band Coldplay met in their first week at university. Singer Chris Martin studied Latin and Greek and got a first-class degree. The same year, Coldplay had a number one hit. The Arctic Monkeys grew up together. Their families were neighbours 
and two of them went to the same primary school. When they were 15, they all received guitars for Christmas. They played music together in Alex Turner's garage and did their first gig when they were 16 years old. Some bands started in a different way. When record companies wanted new bands, they created them. The Spice Girls began in this way. Several boy and girl bands became famous after appearing on a TV reality show. Successful British bands JLS and One Direction both appeared on The X Factor. MP3 Track 5 Asked Needed Started Talked Wanted Lived MP3 Track 6 Welcome back to the film programme. Today we have the comedian James Singer in the studio. Hi James, thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. James, who is your favourite comedy character in films? I have many favourites, but I think my number one is Mr Bean. Why is that? When I saw the film Mr Bean's Holiday, I loved it. It was really funny. There weren't any words, but I liked the visual humour. Millions of people went to see the film in 200 different countries. It earned $300 million. How did Mr Bean begin? It began a long time ago. There was a Mr Bean series on British television from 1990 to 1995. Where did the idea for Mr Bean come from? The actor who plays the character of Mr Bean is Rowan Atkinson. He had the idea for Mr Bean when he was at university. Was Rowan Atkinson similar to Mr Bean? <laughs> no, not at all. Mr Bean was stupid, but Rowan Atkinson went to Oxford University. Did he study acting? No, he didn't study acting or drama or English. He studied electrical engineering. But he joined the Oxford University Dramatic Society. Then he created a character called Mr Cauliflower. Later, he changed the name to Mr Bean. Mr Cauliflower. That's interesting. <laughs> now, I'd like to ask you about your time. MP3 Track 7 Do you know which activities you want to do? Yes, I've decided. On the first day, I'm going to try rock climbing in the morning. Then, I'm going to learn how to sail in the afternoon. That sounds good. I don't like climbing, so I'm going to do the forest walk in the morning. I don't like water either. That's why I'm going to do yoga in the afternoon. I've never done that before. Great. What about jobs? Oh, yes. I can't cook or make a fire, so I'm going to put up tents and do the washing up. Oh, no. I hate washing up. I'm going to make a fire and do the cooking. Can you play the guitar and sing? No way. What about you? <laughs> no, I'm not going to play the guitar and sing. MP3 track 8 Our next guest is technology expert Mike Hughes. Welcome. Thank you. Mike, what do you think about these future predictions for travel? Do you think they will happen or are they just a dream? Well, I think most of the predictions will happen. Of course, I can't see into the future, but uh, anything is possible. Let's start with trains. Do you think high-speed trains will replace air travel? Yes, I do. When people want to travel from city to city, they will choose trains. In Europe and in places like China, high-speed trains are popular now, and in the future they will replace planes in other countries. 
Of course, they won't replace planes for trips across the sea. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> right. And what do you think about holidays on the moon? Well, I think that will be possible one day, but it won't be possible for you and me. At the moment, a ticket costs $200,000, so only rich people will go into space in the next 50 years. Oh, yes, that's right. What do you think about planes without pilots? Well, that will happen. In fact, it already has happened, but not with passenger planes. I don't like the idea of planes without pilots. <laughs> well, I don't like the idea of flying cars. Flying cars are too dangerous. That won't happen. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. What about an elevator into space? Isn't it a crazy idea? Yes, but it's not impossible. I think it will happen. Well, I'm surprised to hear that. Finally, will planes be transparent? No, they won't be completely transparent, but I think there will be bigger windows, and I hope planes of the future will be more comfortable. Yes, I'd like planes to be more comfortable and have at least two human pilots. <laughs> MP3 Track 9 Welcome back to the sports programme. We're at the International Games in Dublin. With us in the studio, we have two athletes, Ellie Jackson from the United States and Sean O'Connell from Ireland. They're going to compete tomorrow, but today they're going to talk to us about their training programme. Let's start with you, Ellie. You're a gymnast. Yes, that's right. Can you tell us about your training programme? Well, I have to practice seven hours a day, that's every day, except Sunday. That's a lot of training. I suppose all that training makes you hungry. Yes, really hungry. And I love food. But it's very important for me to stay slim. So, do you have a strict diet? Yes, I do. I mustn't eat more than 1,500 calories a day. Most women eat about 2,000 calories a day. Do you eat three meals a day? Yes, three small meals, but I mustn't eat anything after five o'clock in the afternoon. What kind of things do you eat? I have to eat protein for lunch, so I usually have fish. I eat a lot of fruit and vegetables, but not many carbohydrates. And no chocolate. That's hard. Oh, well, good luck, Ali. Thanks for talking to us. Thank you. Let's talk to Sean now. Sean, you're a triathlete. Do you eat three times a day? <laughs> no, I have to eat six times a day. Six meals? Yes, I have to eat about 4,000 calories a day. Before a race, I have to eat a lot of carbohydrates, like pasta and rice. Ah, so your diet is very different from Ellie's. Yes. In fact, I mustn't eat protein before a race because it's too heavy. I see. What do you drink? Well, of course, I have to drink a lot of water, but I mustn't drink coffee or tea. Well, it's a big day tomorrow. Will you go to bed early tonight? Oh, yes. I think it's a good idea to sleep eight or more hours before a race. Well, thank you very much for speaking to us. Good luck to both of you. And I hope MP3 Track 10 1. I live in Brazil. My school lunches are great. Today I'm having some rice and beans. I've also got some meat, some salad, and some bread. For dessert, I've got a banana, and I've got some water to drink. 2. I'm French. My school lunch is like lunch at home. I've got a steak and some chips. With that, I have a bread roll and some salad. For dessert, there's a piece of lemon tart and a yogurt. 
I usually drink some water with my lunch. 3. I live in England. I take a packed lunch to school. Today I've got some sandwiches. I've got a tuna sandwich, a ham sandwich and a cucumber sandwich. My mum usually gives me some salad too. Today I've got cucumber and tomatoes. For pudding, I've got some fruit and some chocolate. I've also got some juice to drink. 4. I'm from Australia. My mum makes my lunch before I go to school. Today, I've got some soup and some bread. I've also got two eggs and a packet of crisps. For dessert, I've got some strawberries and a can of Coke to drink. MP3, track 11. My school day starts early. For breakfast, I usually have bread, hot chocolate and a banana. I love fruit, so I always put an apple and an orange in my school bag for later. We have a dog, and I have to take the dog out before I go to school. There's a school bus. I know I should walk to school, but the bus stops right outside my house, and I'm lazy. <laughs> I have lunch at school. The lunches are healthy, and because pasta is my favourite food, I usually have that. I get home around five o'clock. Luckily, my mum's a great cook, so we always eat well at home. MP3, track 12. I'm Rani. My two best friends are Sara and David. Sometimes I think it's strange that we're friends because we're so different. Sara's really funny. She makes me laugh. She's so positive about life. I'd like to be more like her, but she's really good at art and literature and I'm into science and mathematics. David is my other best friend. In some ways, we're quite similar. He's serious and studies a lot like me. But he isn't boring at all. He's interesting and clever. He knows so much about everything. I'd love to be more like David too. Anyway, Sara and David like me as I am, and so I'm happy. MP3, track 13. Teenage dreams and ambitions. They're young, ambitious and optimistic. We meet three teenagers and ask them about their dreams and ambitions. So, Sara, what do you want to be? I want to be a journalist. Are your parents involved in journalism? No, not at all. In fact, journalists are pretty unpopular in my house. My father's interested in the news, but he isn't very keen on journalists. He thinks most of them are arrogant, dishonest and irresponsible. David, why do you want to be a politician? I'm really disappointed with our government. Young people have a lot to say, but politicians don't listen to them. They just think teenagers are lazy and miserable. Why do you think you could be a politician? I'm passionate about my country. I also have the right character. I'm not at all shy. In fact, I'm very outgoing and I'm good at public speaking. I'm only 16 now, so I'm very inexperienced. But I'm serious about politics. Rani, why do you want to be a surgeon? Well, most surgeons in the UK are men, and I think that's unfair and wrong in the 21st century. I think my generation is responsible for getting more women into important jobs. What special qualities do you think you need to be a surgeon? I think I need to be caring, sensible and very hardworking. MP3, track 14. 1. Caring. Selfish. 2. Cheerful. Miserable. 3. Hardworking. Lazy. 4. 
modest, arrogant. Five, outgoing, shy. Six, sensible, crazy. MP3, track 15. One, experienced, inexperienced. Two, fair, unfair. Three, honest, dishonest. Four, popular, unpopular. Five, responsible, irresponsible. MP3, track 16. One, disappointed with. Two, good at. Three, interested in. Four, involved in. Five, keen on. Six, passionate about. Seven, Serious about. Eight. Responsible for. MP3. Track 17. Who's your role model? My role model? Yes. Who inspires you? Oh, Richard Branson. What does he do? He owns Virgin Atlantic. Why do you admire him? Because he's so energetic and successful. He wasn't a good student at school. He's dyslexic. But now he's one of the richest businessmen in the world. Does he give any money to charity? Yes, he's very generous. Which charities does he give money to? Different African charities, I think. Have you ever met him? No, never. But I've seen him several times. What is he doing now? He's developing the first ever spaceport for Virgin Galactic. He wants to send people into space. <laughs> Are you similar to him in any way? Yes, in some ways I am. For example, I'm dyslexic too. But I'm also very interested in business. MP3, track 18. Who inspires you? The person who inspires me is Aung San Suu Kyi. Who is that? She's the Burmese Nobel Peace Laureate. Why do you admire her? I admire her because she's 100% loyal to the people of her country. What does she believe in? She believes in non-violent action. Have you ever seen her? No, I haven't seen her, but I've listened to her speaking. What is she doing now? She's working for peace, democracy and human rights. MP3, track 19. Welcome to the world of work. Today we have two young people in the studio. They are going to talk to us about voluntary work. Welcome to the show, Martin and Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, let's start with you. What kind of voluntary work do you do? I visit elderly people in their homes. There are people in my town who don't have any family. Some of them have a dog or cat, but often they feel lonely and unhappy. I spend time with them and most of the time they just want to talk. That's great, Karen. And what about you, Martin? What does your voluntary work involve? I work on an organic farm. What exactly do you do on the farm? I do lots of different jobs. I plant trees and vegetables. I feed the pigs and chickens. I collect the eggs from the chickens. And I sometimes cook lunch for all the other volunteers. It's a big farm and there are 15 volunteers. 
How many hours do you work, Karen? I'm a student and I have a busy social life. I don't have much free time, especially at the weekend, so I do two or three hours during the week. And you, Martin? I do quite a lot. I go every Saturday and Sunday. We start very early in the morning and finish at about seven o'clock in the evening. It's very hard work and I feel tired at the end of the day. But I don't mind because I love being on the farm. What sort of people volunteer? Fantastic people. <laughs> no,、um, volunteers are caring people. Of course, a lot of people are caring, but volunteers are more likely to do something about it. So, why do you do this voluntary work, Martin? I'm passionate about the environment, and I'm interested in responsible farming. I believe that organic farming is very important for the future. I also like working in a team. I learn important life skills, and I'm more confident than before. Also, I want to study farming and agriculture, so this is good experience. What about you, Karen? Well, there are problems in my community, and I want to help. There's also a selfish reason for doing it. It impresses people, and I like that. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Martin. Now, unemployment is unfortunately a big problem these days. MP3, track twenty. Hi, I'm Becky. Your teacher has asked me to talk to you about doing voluntary work in Africa. I worked in South America a few years ago, and then in Africa last year for six months. It was amazing. There are lots of jobs for volunteers in Africa. I chose to work with animals. And I helped look after young elephants that had no parents. A lot of people do voluntary work in other countries, but you must think about it carefully. It isn't easy work. You have to work long hours, and sometimes things are very different from your own country. For example, the weather is sometimes quite extreme. It can be very hot or very cold. People who volunteer should be fit and healthy, and also interested in different cultures. You learn a lot of new things when you work as a volunteer. Also, you don't work on your own; you work in a team. So you need to be a good team player and have good communication skills. If you think it's right for you, then I can recommend Volunteer Today, the agency that helped me. They are always looking for responsible young people who want to help others and learn new skills. Go online to volunteer today. That's one word. dot com, and you can read all about their projects. Or you can phone them on o seven nine two three three four one five six. Five. I'll give you my number too, in case you have any questions. That's o two three six four five five six seven two one three. MP three, track twenty one. Ambitious. Disappointed. Interested, optimistic, outgoing, passionate, responsible, unpopular. MP three, track twenty two. A. Interested, passionate. B. Ambitious. Outgoing. C. Responsible. Unpopular. D. Disappointed. Optimistic. MP three, track twenty three. 
One. Cooperative. Uncooperative. Two. Healthy. Unhealthy. Three. Loyal. Disloyal. Four. Sensitive. Insensitive. Five. Fit. Unfit. Six. Successful. Unsuccessful. MP3. Track 24. What are teenagers really like? A recent survey shows that there are reasons why teenagers behave badly. The study suggests that teenagers need to sleep more, and that is why 65% of parents say their teenagers are bad-tempered, uncommunicative and lazy. The report also shows that most teenagers are obsessed with their phones. They spend more time chatting online or playing computer games than doing homework. Most parents also say that their teenage children are selfish and unhelpful. Only a few of them help with housework at home. Your comments. Sarah. Why are people so negative about teenagers? Most of us are adorable, cheerful, very hardworking, interesting, brave, generous, loyal, helpful and very good cooks. Oh, and very modest. Janet. The most important thing in my life is not my phone. It's my friends. We love each other. We don't argue or fight. We go to the park after school and we sit under a tree, eat ice cream and talk about guys. We like cooking and camping, not just texting and computer games. I don't have time to read much, but I play the guitar and sing. I'm not a bad-tempered monster. I usually apologise when I'm wrong, and I like spending time with my grandparents. Andrew. Teenagers are definitely not lazy. I get up at 6.30am every school day and I work hard all day. I never make plans to meet friends in the evening. That's when I do my homework. I think I need about nine and a half hours sleep a night, but I usually get only seven hours, so I'm sometimes a bit grumpy, like my parents. <laughs> Ryan. I hate stereotypes. Not all teenagers are the same. Some of us are lazy, some of us aren't. Some of us like chatting online or playing computer games, but some of us prefer to play football or go for a run. OK, some of the things people say about teenagers are true. For example, music is really, really important to us, but we like different kinds of music. We are individuals. Mel. I don't think I'm selfish. I care about other people. I'm interested in the world. I want to travel and learn about other cultures. Then I want to get a job in a developing country. Most of my friends are like me. Where did you find your information? It's wrong. MP3, track 25. 1. Bravery. Brave. 2. Generosity. Generous. 3. Laziness. Lazy. 4. Loyalty. Loyal. 5. Modesty. Modest. 6. Responsibility. Responsible. MP3. Track 26. 1. 
Hello, you must be Nick. I'm Ed. Oh, hi, Ed. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thanks for coming to get me. No problem. How was your flight? Oh, it was okay. I watched a couple of movies and listened to my music. I'm really excited to be here in London. I love travelling and meeting new people. Oh, me too. I've got loads of friends and they want to meet you. Oh, really? That's cool. What do you and your friends usually do in your free time? We spend a lot of time watching DVDs and listening to music. I'm into reggae, hip-hop and rap. I don't really like rock or heavy metal. <laughs> Me neither. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I've just got one sister. She's a model. Oh, is she? Yes, but she doesn't live at home. Oh, I've got a sister too. She's training to be a pilot. Wow, that's interesting. OK, here's our train. Let's go. Two. Kate? Hi, I'm Rachel. Oh, hi. Did you have a good trip? Yes, it was fine, thanks. Great. Let's wait over here. My dad is meeting us. Would you like a drink of something while we wait? Tea? Oh, no thanks. I'm not very keen on tea. Really? Oh, I love it. I drink it all day. So, is this your first visit to England? Yes, it is. I don't like travelling. Don't you? Oh, I do. I want to go round the world. What do you like doing in your free time? I'm really into sport. I do boxing and I play soccer for my school. Wow, that's interesting. I'm terrible at sport. I'm more interested in music. I play drums in a band. What sort of music do you like? I'm into classical music. I play the violin. Do you? Right. Do you like shopping for clothes? There are some great shops near my house. I can't afford to spend money on clothes. I'm saving to buy a new pair of boxing gloves. Boxing gloves? Oh. Um. Oh, look! There's Dad. Dad! MP3, track 27. 1. I've got thousands of songs on my iPod. Have you? Cool. 2. I love Spanish and Italian food. Really? Do you? 3. My parents have got an apartment in Paris. Wow, that's interesting. Have they? 4. There are 40 students in my class. Are there? Really? 5. I can play the guitar. Cool! Can you? 6. I'm passionate about politics. Really? Are you? MP3, track 28. 1. I'm worried about the world. Are you? I'm not. 2. I'm not worried about the world. Me neither. 3. I love reading poetry. Me too. 4. I don't like reading poetry. Don't you? I do. 5. I've got lots of cousins. Me too. 6. I haven't got any cousins. Haven't you? I have. MP3, track 29. Welcome to Connections Podcast. We asked you to match 
some dates with some of the most important digital firsts in the world of computer technology. Here are the answers. We sometimes think that YouTube has existed for a long time, but in fact, it's not that old. The first time someone put a video on YouTube was in April 2005. It's a short film called Me at the Zoo. It's rather boring, but because it was the first YouTube video, millions of people still watch it. Of course, email is much older than YouTube. In 1971, an American computer engineer called Ray Tomlinson sent the first electronic mail, or email. He is also the first person to use the at symbol for email addresses. Why? Simply because he thought it was a good idea and he needed something to separate the username from the name of the internet server. Apple produced its first iPod in 2001 and, together with the iTunes store, it completely changed the way that people bought and listened to music. These days, people don't only download music from iTunes, you can also buy films, books, TV programs and apps. At first, Apple just made computers. They created the first desktop computer with a keyboard and a mouse in 1984. It was the Macintosh. This was the first time you could click on icons to start a program or open a file. A few years later, in 1991, a British physicist, Tim Berners-Lee, was working at the CERN Research Centre in Switzerland. He invented the World Wide Web. The first website was the CERN address. It went online in August 1991. It's difficult to find information on the Internet without a search engine. Today, the most popular search engine is Google. But the first search engine was called Archie. It was created in 1990 a year before the first website. Facebook is the most popular social networking site in the world, but it wasn't the first. In 1995, classmates.com became the first social networking site. Students connected with their high school friends through classmates.com. In fact, more than a hundred couples met through the site and got married. In 2006, a man called Jack Dorsey was in a meeting when he had an idea. Why not use text messaging to communicate with a group of people? He decided to call these text messages tweets and Twitter was born. Now, thanks to Jack Dorsey, you can follow all your favourite celebrities on Twitter. So, that's it. Did you find the right dates for the digital firsts? The next podcast is on the life story of Steve Jobs. You'll remember him for... MP3, track 30. 1. Broadband. 2. Desktop computer. 3. Internet server. 4. Keyboard. 5. Laptop. 6. Password. 7. Search engine. 8. Social networking. 9. Text message. 10. Username. 11. Website. MP3. Track 31. 1.
click on an icon. 2. Download music. 3. Follow somebody on Twitter. 4. Go online. 5. Open a document. 6. Visit a website. MP3, track 32. OK, Grandma. I'm going to tell you how to use Skype. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Are you at your computer? Yes, but it isn't on. OK, switch it on. OK, I've switched it on. Do I need to log on to Facebook? No, no, you don't have to log on to anything. We're doing Skype, not Facebook. Just click on the Skype icon. Uh, is it blue? Yes, click on the blue icon, use the mouse. OK, I think I've opened the page. I can see a long list of names. That's right. Now, scroll down the page until you find my name. OK. I'm scrolling down the page. Oh, oh, I've gone too far. That's all right. Just scroll up a bit. Ah, yes. Here we are. OK. Click on my name and you should see a phone icon. It's green. Yes, I can see a green icon. Shall I click on it? Yes. It's ringing. I know. It's my number. Hello? Hello? Oh, I can see you. And I can see you too. You can hang up now and we can chat on Skype. OK. Oh, it's lovely to see you. Are you growing your hair? MP3, track 33. 1. Click on. 2. Hang up. 3. Log on. 4. Scroll up. 5. Scroll down. 6. Switch on. MP3, track 34. A. Chemistry. B. Archaeology. C. Ecology. D. Geology. E. Marine Biology F Physics MP3, track 35 1. You're really good at science. Are you going to be a scientist? I'd like to. My dad's an archaeologist, and of course he wants me to do archaeology. But I'm not very keen on digging up old things. I'd prefer to do something useful, like ecology, and help with the world's energy problems and things. How about you? When I was younger, I was quite good at chemistry. I enjoyed doing experiments. It was fun. Now it's getting a bit too difficult. I think I'll study languages. 2. There was an amazing programme on TV last night. Did you see it? All about how mountains are formed. I did. You're right. It was fascinating. I really enjoyed geology. Me too. It's a good series. Last week's was about famous physicists. I'm hopeless with physics, so it was good for me. I missed that one. But next week's is about marine biology. Divers in Australia have filmed incredible plants underwater. I mustn't miss that one. MP3, track 36.
One. Everybody's surprised that I'm a scientist. My father's an English teacher, and my mother's a translator. But in high school, my chemistry teacher gave me the idea to be a scientist. He gave me books to read about science, and I saw that people were making new discoveries that were useful to society. When I read that they were finding new cures for serious illnesses, I decided I wanted to be a chemist. Two. I work with people who have new ideas about energy sources, like solar and wind power. We're doing research into climate change and trying to discover new ways to produce energy. And this is why I became an ecologist. I want to study ways of protecting the environment. This is important work for the future of the planet. Three. Science is not just my job; it's the way I see the world. I always want to understand how things work. Why are they like that? How did we get here? How old is the universe? You know the really big questions. I love doing experiments, analyzing data, and finding logical explanations. I don't think I became a physicist. I was born that way. Four. Like many archaeologists, I became interested in archaeology when we were studying ancient Egypt and mummies in school. It was fascinating. When I was fourteen, my class took a school trip to Paris, and we visited the famous museum, the Louvre. I spent hours in the Egyptian room. And decided that I wanted to know more about people who lived thousands of years ago. Five. The first time I went scuba diving, I saw a little fish swimming away into the distance, and at that moment I thought, "Oh yes, that's what I want to do. I want to explore oceans, collect evidence about global warming." And help to protect marine life. I love my job. I can't understand why everybody isn't a marine biologist. MP three, track thirty seven. One. Archaeology. Archaeologist. Two. Biology. Biologist. Three. Chemistry. Chemist. Four. Ecology. Ecologist. Five. Geology. Geologist. Six. Mathematics. Mathematician. Seven. Physics. Physicist. Eight. Science. Scientist. MP three, track thirty eight. One. Analysis. Analyze. Two. Discovery. Discover. Three. Evolution. Evolve. Four. Exploration. Explore. Five. Imagination. Imagine. Six. Observation. Observe. Seven. Preservation. Preserve. Eight. Protection. Protect. Nine. Solution. 
solve. MP3, track 39. Houston, we have a problem. It was the 13th of April, 1970, two days after the launch of Apollo 13. BBC journalist Reg Turnill was reporting on the mission from the Space Centre in Houston. He describes the moment he realised there was a problem with Apollo 13. I looked into mission control just before going to bed. I was going through the door when I heard Jim Lovell say, Houston, we have a problem. Instead of going to bed, the journalist went back to his desk and stayed there for the next three days. Apollo 13's commander, Jim Lovell, together with his colleagues Fred Hayes and Jack Swigert, were carrying out NASA's third mission to the moon. Lovell and Hayes were planning to walk on the moon, but this never happened. Nearly two days into the flight, things were going so smoothly that Joe Kerwin, on duty at Mission Control, told the crew, The spacecraft is in real good shape. We're bored to tears down here. Several hours later, the crew heard a loud explosion. On board the spacecraft, warning lights were flashing. One of the fuel tanks was empty, and one of them was close to zero. Thirteen minutes after the explosion, Jim Lovell looked out of the hatch. Gas was escaping into space. NASA reacted quickly. They called in all the most experienced astronauts, including Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. They worked day and night with the NASA engineers and the crew of Apollo 13 to find a solution. Both Mission Control and the astronauts remained very calm, but by breakfast time, the media were going crazy. Millions of people were following the events on television. The newspapers reported that the astronauts only had a 10% chance of getting home safely. Meanwhile, on board, the astronauts did not discuss the possibility of not returning home. They were trying to figure out what was happening and how to fix it. Supplies of oxygen and water were running out, but with the help of the engineers at Mission Control, they came up with a plan. The spacecraft orbited the moon, using its gravity to return to Earth. As the spacecraft left outer space and re-entered into the Earth's atmosphere, nobody knew whether the astronauts would live or die. Under parachutes, the spacecraft appeared through the clouds, and exhausted workers at Mission Control were finally able to breathe a sigh of relief, raise their hands, and cheer. The capsule successfully returned to Earth on Friday the 17th of April, 1970. It splashed down in the Pacific Ocean near Tonga, where a rescue boat was waiting to recover the three astronauts. MP3, track 40 One Small Step for Man In 1962, US President J.F. Kennedy promised to put a man on the moon before 1970. It was seven more years before NASA figured out how to do it. In July 1969, when time was running out, three astronauts carried out the historic mission on board Apollo 11. American astronaut Neil Armstrong opened the hatch and became the first man to walk on the moon. In Houston, engineers who were on duty at Mission Control 
breathed a sigh of relief when they saw Armstrong step onto the moon. All over the world, people were watching on TV and they cheered as they heard Armstrong say his famous words, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Armstrong came up with his famous words after landing on the moon. MP3, track 41. One, find a solution. Two, fix a problem. Three, follow events. Four, get home. Five, go crazy. Six, raise your hand. MP3, track 42. Grandad, how did you communicate with your friends before phones? Before phones? How old do you think I am? We used to have a phone in our house. One phone for everybody? Yes, it was in the sitting room. How did you use to text? We didn't text. Text messaging didn't exist then. What? I send at least 30 texts a day. How did you use to make arrangements with your friends? We used to talk on the phone. In the sitting room? That's not very private, is it? Well, we used to have our private conversations when we saw one another. So all your friends used to live near you, did they? My best friends lived near me, yes. I also had a pen friend in France, and we used to write letters. Letters? I can't imagine life without the internet. When you were young, everything used to be so slow. Hmm, but we didn't know anything different. But what did you used to do before mobile phones and social networking? We used to cycle to one another's houses, go into town and buy records. We used to meet at people's houses. I remember my mother used to get really annoyed with all my friends in my bedroom. She used to tell us to turn the music down. Have you got any photos of your friends? Uh, no, I haven't actually. My mum and dad bought me a camera for my 16th birthday, but I never used it. These days it's so easy, taking photos with a digital camera, but we didn't have them then. How many friends did you used to have? Oh, only five or six good ones. Five or six? Do you know how many online friends I've got? A hundred? Six hundred and thirty-nine. And how many do you see regularly? Oh, five or six? There you are. Things haven't changed much at all. MP3, track 43. Hi, Ed. How was Australia? It was really good, thanks. Except for the day I nearly died. What happened? I was doing some climbing. At first, the sun was shining and I was enjoying myself. But all of a sudden, the weather changed. It became really foggy and I couldn't see the path. Oh dear, that sounds frightening. I was pretty worried. I continued for a while, but finally, I realised I was lost. What did you do? Fortunately, I had my phone with me, so I called my father, 9,000 miles away in England. He called the Australian police and told them where I was. Then they called me. Unfortunately, my battery went dead after five seconds. It was dark and cold. I sat under a rock, put on my torch and waited. Oh no, what a nightmare. Eventually, they found me. I was so relieved. I used to go climbing on my own all the time, but I'll never do it again. MP3, track 44.
One. Hiya, Charlie. I am so worried about our science exam this afternoon. I didn't sleep last night. This afternoon? It's this morning, not this afternoon. What? I thought it started at 2.30. No, that's English. Science is at 10.15. But that's only one hour. Yep. Don't panic. Two. Eva, it's me, Gran. I'm phoning to say thank you for my birthday present. You're very naughty. It's much too expensive. But I love it. It's so small and light. I can carry it around the house and go online when I want to. I use my PC a lot, but you can't carry that. You can go online on your phone, can't you? I think that would be a bit difficult for me. Thanks again, my dear. Three. We went to the beach to test the seawater in our science lesson yesterday. That sounds fun. We're going next week. I hope it doesn't rain. Yeah, it's better when it's sunny. It was cloudy and windy for us yesterday, but at least it wasn't cold. Don't wear those shoes when you go. They'll get wet. Four. I really didn't like science lessons when I was at school. We did lots of tests in the laboratory, which was boring. Our teacher often just read things from a book and we copied them down. I didn't remember anything and I didn't pass any exams. Today, teachers make science a lot more interesting. Sometimes they even show films and documentaries about nature in class. It's a good way to get students interested in science. Five. My dad's taking me to the science exhibition tomorrow. Do you want to come with us? We're going in his car. But it's really hard to park near the exhibition. I was planning to go by bike, but I think it's going to rain tomorrow. That's a good point. I'll tell Dad. Why don't we all go on the underground? That's quick and warm. Good idea. Much better than freezing on my bike. Six. Did you hear about the accident on the motorway this morning? Yes. There's a five kilometre traffic jam. I saw some pictures on Facebook. The police say that a driver was texting on his phone and drove into a lorry. No one's hurt, thank goodness. I must email my brother. He's going to travel along the motorway later. No, not a good idea. MP3, track 45. 1. Book Review Literary Critic 2. Classical Music Composer 3. Newspaper Article Journalist 4. Novel Novelist 5. Play Playwright 6. Poetry Poet 7. Screenplay Script Scriptwriter 8. Song Songwriter MP3 Track 46 1. Autobiography 2. Science fiction 3. Cookbook 4. Travel guide 5. Crime story 6. Classic novel 7. Encyclopedia 8. Ghost story 9. Fairy tales 10. Biography 
MP3, track 47. 1. An act in a play. 2. A chapter in a book. A chapter in a novel. 3. An episode of a sitcom. 4. A scene in a film. A scene in a play. 5. A track on an album. 6. A verse in a song. A verse in a poem. MP3, track 48. It's 2.30 on Saturday afternoon and you're listening to The Culture Programme. In this part of the programme, we invite a guest to talk about their Artist of the Week. This week, we have Katie West in the studio. Katie is the editor of Photo Monthly magazine. Welcome to The Culture Programme. Thank you. Katie, tell us about your Artist of the Week. My Artist of the Week is a French photographer. He takes photographs and makes them enormous. Then he pastes them in public places. Does he have a name? Ah, well, he's called J.R. These are his initials, but his full name is a secret. This is because most of the work he does is not legal. So, what kind of photographs does he take? And where can we see them? He takes black and white portraits of people and pastes them on buildings, walls and bridges. He has had exhibitions in museums such as the Pompidou Centre in Paris, but his favourite art gallery is in the street. He wants people who don't usually go to museums to see his work. He usually takes photographs of people with difficult lives. For his first project, he went to a very poor and dangerous suburb of Paris and took photos of the people who live there. Then he pasted them in the rich parts of the city centre. He has worked in many different places of the world. In Africa, he did a project called Women Are Heroes. He put enormous photographs of women on the rooftops of their houses. This gives women a unique chance to tell their story to the world. One girl from Kenya said, I'm happy if somebody sees my photograph and asks, Who is that girl? What does she do? In Brazil, he went to a famous favela in Rio. He pasted photographs of the women on the houses they live in. The eyes of the portraits look towards the centre of Rio. It's a powerful message that says, don't forget about us. Thank you, Katie. JR sounds like a fascinating artist. And next on The Culture Programme, we speak to... MP3, track 49. 1. Brazil. Brazilian. 2. Italy Italian 3 Egypt Egyptian 4 Mexico Mexican 5 Hungary Hungarian 6 Poland Polish MP3, track 50 Art People Painter Photographer Sculptor Type Painting Landscape 
Portrait. Sculpture. Photo. Black and white. Color. Music. People. Band. Composer. Singer. Songwriter. Type. Opera. Song. Symphony. MP3. Track 51. Simon. I like a good story, and I particularly like factual films. I enjoy films that teach me something about people in the world. I don't like violence or blood. Paula. When I choose a film, I want it to be relaxing and entertaining. I don't want anything serious, and I don't mind if the storyline is unoriginal. I like funny films with happy endings. Julia. I like films about relationships, but I'm not keen on a lot of the romantic comedies because they're so unrealistic. I quite like emotional films, films that make me laugh or cry. John. I hate boring films or anything too romantic. I like thrillers, but not very scary, dramas and crime stories with good acting and clever dialogue. Ben. I like films that make me forget real life. Science fiction, fantasy or even horror. I love films with good special effects and lots of tension. I want to be scared. A. Sherlock Holmes. This action-adventure film directed by Guy Ritchie takes place in London in 1891. Robert Downey Jr. plays the role of Sherlock Holmes. He is one of the most interesting characters I've ever seen on screen. The special effects are amazing, and the screenplay is excellent. It's fun, it's entertaining, and Robert Downey Jr. will hold your attention from beginning to end. B. 127 Hours This film is based on the true story of a mountain climber, Aaron Ralston, who falls into a canyon in Utah. He can't get out of the canyon because his arm is under a rock. Over the next five days, he thinks about his life, his friends, and his family. He wants to survive. After the fifth day, he cuts off his arm. It is an inspiring film, and James Franco gives a brilliant performance as Aaron Ralston. C. The Proposal the Proposal is a romantic comedy that takes place in Alaska. The plot is predictable, but the dialogue is amusing, and the lead actors give excellent performances. Sandra Bullock plays the role of the central character. She is Canadian, and when her visa expires, she has 24 hours to leave the USA and the job she loves. Her American assistant, played by Ryan Reynolds, agrees to marry her, and she promises him a promotion. This is an enjoyable film. D. My Sister's Keeper This film is based on a novel by Jodie Picot. The central character, Kate, has leukemia. Her younger sister has numerous operations to help her sister survive. This is a moving film about what it means to be a good parent, a good sister, a good person. The acting is brilliant, with Cameron Diaz in the role of the mother. You'll need a big box of tissues. E. The King's Speech 
Everything about this award-winning historical drama is perfect. The screenplay, the costumes, the settings, the soundtrack, and of course the wonderful performance by Colin Firth in the role of King George VI. The film is based on the true life story of the king's speech impediment and his unusual friendship with his Australian speech therapist. A great film. F. Let Me In. This thriller is the story of a friendship between a lonely young boy and a strange pale girl. The girl has a mysterious secret. The filming, the music and the performances are perfect. In some scenes, the suspense will make you jump out of your seat. You won't forget it for a long time. MP3, track 52 Amusing Boring Emotional Entertaining Funny Inspiring Moving Predictable Relaxing Unoriginal Unrealistic MP3 Track 53 Shakespeare wrote 37 plays. Romeo and Juliet is the most popular, but Hamlet is the longest and the most challenging for actors. Both Mariah Carey and Christina Aguilera are very successful pop singers with great voices. Christina Aguilera has an amazing vocal range of four octaves. But Mariah Carey's vocal range is even better, an impressive five octaves. The two-day Woodstock Festival in Poland is huge. It attracts 700,000 people, but it isn't as big as Summerfest USA. Summerfest is an 11-day festival, and it attracts over a million people, making it the world's biggest pop festival. How many people visit museums in your country? Seven million people visit the Palace Museum in Beijing, China, every year. But the Musée de Louvre in Paris is busier. It gets 8.5 million visitors per year. The Harry Potter films were all very expensive to make, but Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End was more expensive than any of them. It had a huge budget of $300 million. MP3, track 54. I fancy watching a good thriller tonight. Have you seen One Shot with Tom Cruise? No, I don't like Tom Cruise. Why? He's too short. Well, that's not his fault. Don't you think he's a good actor? He's all right, but I don't think he's right for the main character in that film. I've read the book and Jack Reacher is very tall. He's 1 metre 95. Tom Cruise is only 1 metre 70. It's ridiculous. He's not tall enough. Well, it doesn't really matter on the screen, does it? Look at Zac Efron. He's really small. Yes, but he's gorgeous. <laughs> oh, I see. Tom Cruise isn't good looking enough. No, I think the problem is when you read a book and then you see the film. You have your own image of the character, and then when you see the film, they're not as you imagined. Hmm, sometimes it works. Daniel Radcliffe is perfect. He's exactly as I imagined Harry Potter. That's true. But what about the Twilight Saga? Robert Pattinson is OK, but Kristen Stewart is too serious. Too serious? Of course she's serious. She's in love with a vampire. Let's watch Twilight again. I thought you wanted to watch a thriller tonight, you... MP3, track 55.
In this photo, I can see a famous author signing a book for a young boy. In the background, there are bookshelves, so I think they're in a bookshop. The author is a woman with blonde hair. She's sitting behind a desk. She looks friendly and she's looking at the boy. She's probably asking him what his name is so that she can write a personal message. The boy on the left is wearing a blue top. I think he's about eight years old. He looks a bit shy, but I imagine he's very proud to meet the author of his favourite book. Personally, I'd love to meet my favourite author. MP3, track 56. Photo B. The photo shows a room in an art gallery. There's an exhibition of modern art. In the background, there are two abstract paintings. There's a woman standing in front of one of the paintings. In the foreground, there's a young girl. I imagine she's about five or six years old. She looks bored and tired because she's lying down on a bench. Perhaps she's the daughter of the woman in the background. I think it's summer because the girl is wearing a summer dress and the woman is wearing white trousers and sandals. Photo C In this photo there are some young people at a music festival. I think they're watching a band. On the left there's a girl with red hair wearing a green shirt. In the foreground there are three girls laughing and clapping to the music. I imagine they're having a good time. In the middle of the photo, there's a boy with a purple headband. The people in this photo look happy and excited. They're smiling and some people have their arms in the air. Personally, I don't like crowded places. I prefer listening to music on my iPod. MP3, track 57. Type of house. A bungalow. A cottage. A detached house. A semi-detached house. A terraced house. A flat. An eco house. Location. In the city center. In the suburbs. In a village. Near the sea. In the countryside. On a housing estate. Building materials. Brick. Concrete. Mud. Stone. Wood. Description Modern Traditional Spacious Cozy Open plan Lots of natural light MP3 Track 58 Inside 1 Bookcase. 2. Carpet. 3. Cooker. 4. Cupboard. 5. Floorboards. 6. Kitchen sink. 7. Shelves. 8. Stairs. 9. Windowsill. 10. Wood burner. 11. Worktop. Outside. 12. Back door. 13. Front door. 14. Path. 15. Patio. 16. 
pond. 17. Porch. 18. Shed. 19. Stone wall. MP3. Track 59. 1. Excuse me, would you like to live in the Hobbit house? I can see advantages and disadvantages. One big advantage is that you can make a noise and there are no neighbours to make a complaint. But I think it's hard work to live in a house like this. In a modern kitchen, it's easy to do the cooking, the ironing and the washing. But in an eco house, you need more time to do the housework. And the garden is enormous. Imagine how much time it takes to do the gardening. Two. Excuse me, would you like to live in the Hobbit house? Yes, I'd love to live in a house like this. It's beautiful, but it's quite small, so I think it's important to be very tidy. You have to make your bed every day, do the washing up after meals, and do a little housework every day. I'm very tidy, so I could live there. But the rest of my family make too much mess. 3. Excuse me, would you like to live in the Hobbit house? Um, not really. I don't like being in the country. I think this house is too far from the shops. What happens when they want to do the shopping? And what about the days when they're too tired to make dinner and they want to go to a restaurant? It's impossible when you live here. MP3, track 60. Make a decision. Make a noise. Make a complaint. Make a mess. Make dinner. Make your bed. Do your homework. Do the cooking. Do the ironing. Do the gardening. Do the housework. Do the shopping. Do the washing. Do the washing up. MP3, track 61. I've been a member for three years now. Since I became a member, I've stayed in 32 countries in different types of accommodation. I've stayed in a luxury studio apartment in Manhattan, on a houseboat in Amsterdam, and in a basement flat in London. All for free. I've been a couch surfing host for two years now, and I've already met more than 30 people. At the moment, Mickey is visiting from Tokyo. I've only known her for a week, but I'm sure we'll remain friends. We have so much in common. Miki is happy too. She studied English for ten years, but she's never had the chance to speak with a native speaker before. When I show a guest around Oxford, I see my own city in a new way. For example, I haven't visited the Natural History Museum since I was at primary school, but I'll go there with Mickey. She has been here for nearly a week, but she hasn't felt homesick because she says I make her feel at home. MP3, track 62. 1. I have a big family. There are seven of us in this house, and we're all very noisy people. It's OK when you're feeling sociable, but sometimes I want to be on my own and have some quiet time. So I shut my bedroom door, put my headphones on, and listen to music or chat with my friends. I have a sign on the door that says, Keep out, and it's not just for my parents. My brothers and sisters are not welcome either. My room is a place for me to get away from other people. 
too. I like my room to be clean and tidy, but unfortunately, it's my sister's room too, and she's very disorganised. She says it's because she's artistic, and artistic people are untidy. I think she's just lazy. When we were younger, it was fun because we used to play together and chat until midnight. But now she doesn't spend much time at home. She's older than me, and she has a really good social life. So I have the room to myself most of the time. Three. I think my room reflects my personality. My parents let me decorate it in my favourite colour, so I painted the walls black and put different coloured lights everywhere. I love making things. I use my room as a kind of studio. I paint, write music lyrics. On my computer, I make music mixes and create light shows to go with them. It's awesome. When my friends have a party, they always ask me to do the music. Four. I like my room, but there isn't much furniture. Just a desk, a wardrobe, and a bed. I've got a couple of posters of my favourite artists on the wall: Klimt and Picasso. I don't really spend much time there. I'm very sporty, so I'm usually out playing football or at the gym. When I'm at home, I either watch television in the sitting room, or I have meals with the rest of the family in the kitchen. I usually use my desk in my room for my studies, or sometimes I study downstairs. Five. My room isn't anything special, but for some reason my friends really like coming round here. I think it's because my parents are cool. Well, they're usually at work, so it's just my grandmother here, and she can't hear very well. So we can make lots of noise and play music really loud. My room is a kind of meeting place for all my friends. We chat, play computer games, and decide what to do at the weekend. MP3, track sixty-three. Daffod. Okay, I'm going to give you a little tour of my bedroom and tell you about three things. Three of my most treasured possessions. So, let's start over here. On my desk, there are two screens: my laptop and my TV. My laptop is the first of my most treasured possessions. I've only had it for two weeks. It was a birthday present. I love it. It can do everything. Over there, in the corner next to the bookcase, is my guitar. It's really old. I've had it for about five years, but it was my dad's before. He gave it to me for my eleventh birthday. Finally, on the wall above my bed, I've got a flag. It's the Welsh flag. My family are from Wales, and I'm proud of being Welsh, so that's really important. Karen. So welcome to my bedroom. I want to show you my three most treasured possessions. That's my wardrobe over there, and on top of it, there is my collection of animals. They're fluffy toys, and I've had them since I was a baby. The big lion is probably my favourite, but I love them all. Next to my bed, there's a bedside table, and my favourite bedside lamp is on it. It's special to me because my father brought it back from Africa. Opposite my bed, you can see my bookshelves. They're full of magazines, books, and DVDs, but. On the bottom shelf, I've got a collection of shells. These are very important to me because they are souvenirs from all the holidays I've had since I was five years old. MP3, track sixty-four. Bar. Blue. Calm. Cheap. Dark, dirt, earth, floor, 
heat, lawn, porch, room, scene, view, work. MP3, track 65. 1. E. Cheap. Heat. Scene. 2. Ooh. Blue. Room. View. 3. Or Floor Lawn Porch 4 A uh, Dirt Earth Work 5 R Bar Calm Dark MP3 Track 66 1. An old wooden single bed 2. A large yellow cotton duvet 3. A lovely blue teddy bear MP3, track 67. Five places to visit before you die. The Grand Canyon, Arizona, USA. Awesome is how people describe the Grand Canyon. But words cannot describe it. You have to see it to believe it. The Grand Canyon in northwest Arizona, USA, is 446 kilometers long, 29 kilometers wide, and about 1,800 meters deep. Scientists believe the canyon is 17 million years old. It is not the deepest or the longest canyon in the world, However, it is probably the most beautiful. The rocks change colour depending on the time of day, from red and orange to grey and ochre brown. The best view of the Grand Canyon is from a helicopter. But for a real adventure, you need to take a boat along the valley of the River Colorado. Venice, Italy. The floating city in northeast Italy is famous for its unique beauty and wonderful architecture. The city consists of around 117 islands and 409 bridges. You can walk through the narrow streets for hours and then sit in a square and admire the impressive buildings. St. Mark's is the most famous square and the central point of the city. The public transport system is fantastic. For example, the famous Vaporetto river bus only costs about five euros. It takes you all the way down the Grand Canal. Alternatively, you can pay around 150 euros to do the same trip on a gondola. Christ the Redeemer, Rio de Janeiro The statue of Christ the Redeemer is 38 metres high and dominates the city of Rio de Janeiro. It is one of the best-known sites of this lively city. When visitors go to the top of the Corcovado mountain to visit the statue, they get a breathtaking view of the city. From there you can see other famous sites. 
the Sugar Loaf Mountain, the Atlantic Ocean, the harbour, and the long sandy beaches. As you drive up the narrow road to the top of the mountain, you pass favelas, slums, rich neighbourhoods, and green rainforest. The Great Barrier Reef, Australia It is one of the most amazing natural wonders of the world. It is located in the Coral Sea and covers 2,600 kilometres along the northeast coast of Australia. It consists of around 3,000 coral reefs and hundreds of tropical islands. It is a popular destination for scuba divers. They love the clear and shallow seawater and all the different types of fish. The golden sands of the tropical beaches attract about one million tourists each year. The Lost City of Petra, Jordan The Lost City of Petra is located in the rose-coloured mountains of southwestern Jordan. This ancient city was once a busy trading centre and the capital of the Nabataean Empire. It had a population of around 20,000. They made spectacular monuments from the pink limestone rock. The city was lost for centuries. Nobody knows exactly when or why people left the city. Luckily, European travellers found it again in the 19th century. Today, you can visit the spectacular ruins on foot, on horseback or by camel. MP3, track 68 A beach A bridge A canyon The coast A harbour An island A monument A mountain A rainforest A reef A river a ruin, a slum, a square, a statue, a temple, a valley. MP3, track 69. I'm having a birthday party on the 25th. Can you come? That's next Saturday, right? Yes, that sounds great. Are you having it at home? No, our apartment isn't big enough. I'm using my aunt and uncle's house. They're really nice. They say it's fine. Oh, that's kind of them. Do they know how many friends you've got? Not yet. I'm going to tell them later. We'll probably use the basement. It's huge. A basement? Are you going to decorate it? I suppose so. I'm not very good at that sort of thing. Don't worry, I'll help you. What are you doing later? I'm going to text everybody with the invitation now, but after that I'm free. MP3, track 70. Two of my friends are helping me prepare the room on Saturday afternoon. We're going to hang sheets on the walls and the ceiling. Then we're going to put coloured lights everywhere. We're having a band and a DJ from 8 to midnight. I've already booked them. OK. I think I'll warn the neighbours. We've decided to have a fancy dress theme. Everybody is coming as their favourite film character. Oh, good. I think I'll come as Captain Jack Sparrow. No, we're going out to the theatre, remember? I told you yesterday. Oh, no, I was joking. Now, what are you going to eat? That's all arranged. Mum is making some pizzas. And what about the cleaning the next day? Oh, um, don't worry. I'll do that with my friend, Louisa. She won't mind. 
MP3, track 71. What shall we do today? Hmm, why don't we go to London Dungeon? My sister went there last year and she says it's really scary. Oh, I don't really like scary things. I'd rather go to Madame Tussauds. Oh, OK. Let's go to Madame Tussauds this morning, then. What about this afternoon? It's a nice day, so how about going on the London Eye? I really want to see the views of London. That's a good idea. Then we could go on a speedboat on the River Thames. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. It's very expensive. Oh, yes. You're right. I need my money to buy souvenirs. I think we should go shopping on Oxford Street. Oxford Street? No! Let's go to Camden Market instead. It's more fun. Oh, yes. That sounds great. I want to buy some clothes. Yes, me too. Do you fancy going to the cinema this evening? Yes. Let's see a 3D film at the IMAX cinema. <laughs> Good idea. But right now I'm starving. Let's have something to eat. MP3. Track 72. Do you fancy going to the cinema tonight? That's a good idea. What do you want to see? The new film with Jennifer Aniston. Oh, no. I'm not keen on romantic comedy. I'd rather see an action film. OK. Let's see the new James Bond instead. Great. How about having a burger before we go? <laughs> Why not? We could try that new burger bar in town. MP3. Track 73. OK, everyone, listen carefully. We're just about to set off on our trip to Mansford House. You all know about the project you have to write afterwards, so please, no spelling mistakes. It's Mansford House with double M. That is M-A-N-N-S-F-O-R-D, right? So the coach will take us through the forest. Look out for wild horses and deer. You can sometimes see them at the edge of the road. The journey to Mansford House will take about 45 minutes and we hope to arrive at 10.30. Then you'll have a guided tour of the house for an hour. It's very interesting and the guide will tell you a very scary ghost story. It's about young Catherine Mansford who died in the garden pond 200 years ago. Then you'll have some free time in the afternoon to walk around the gardens. There's a lovely bridge across the River Test that runs through the garden. When you go across it, look down the river and there's a spectacular view. The coach will pick us up in the car park at 4.15, so make sure you're not late. <laughs> 